Hello everyone and welcome to this second of five webinars in our cargo claim series entitled Bill of Lading as a Contract, Identity of the Parties. Many of you will have seen the previous introductory webinar with Henry and Tom. If you missed it, it's now on YouTube. As they touched on in more detail, and for those of you who have not worked with us previously. We are a top 50 full service law firm with offices throughout the east of England and in London. There are um, 850, uh, over 850 people who work at, at Burkitt's, of whom over 90 are litigation lawyers. If I could have the next slide, please. Of those 90, there are 13 of us who specialize in shipping and international trade. And uh, there we all are on the slide. Um, next slide, please. So today's talk is, is really um, one, of, one of two halves. We're going to, to look at who um, are the parties to the contract evidenced by the Bill of Lading. And then on the 18th of April, uh, we shall look at what the actual terms of the contract are. Um, and so your, your speakers um, today are, are Lisa Wortley and myself. Um, Lisa, who is going to do the first part of the talk, is a consultant solicitor in our team. And until a few years ago, she was a, a partner at Burkitt's. And I'm Alex Smith. I'm a senior associate in the team, having joined upon qualification in um, 2015. Um, so I could have the next slide, please. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Lisa, who's going to, to, going to take you through the, the questions of um, who has title to sue under a bill of lading and Colson 1992. Well, thank you, Alex, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this morning, as Alex said, we're going to be looking at the question, who? Who has title to sue under the bill of lading contract? And who can that person sue under the bill of lading contract? And to start with, we might want to wonder why this question arises at all because normally under an English law contract there are two parties if something goes wrong with the performance of the contract then one party sues the other for any losses but um, as Henry and Tom discussed last time and as those of you who are familiar with bills of lading will know well they're not like other English law contracts and this is why um, because they have three distinct functions they can be evidence of the contract of carriage, which is really what we're also concerned with in these seminars. They are evidence of goods shipped and they are a document of title. And that's really what we're looking at today. And that has two parts to it. First of all, the bill of lading is evidence of a person's title to the goods, that person's right to demand delivery of the goods from the carrier. And secondly, it's also a document of title in the sense of giving that person the right to bring a claim for anything that's gone wrong with the carriage. Next slide, please. So why does this all matter so much? Well, obviously, the right claimant has to start a claim if it comes to starting proceedings against the carrier. And the burden of proof is on the claimant to establish title to sue. But it's important as well before that point's reached, at the time when the first time extension is requested, it's essential that that time extension is given to the correct party. Otherwise, the correct party will later on be time barred, won't be able to bring the claim at all. And it's equally important in the context of security. If an LOU is, has been requested and issued, that LOU must be in favour of the correct party. Next slide, please. So just to summarise that, the usual rule under an English contract is that only the parties to the contract are bound by it. So they can sue each other, but nobody else has any rights under the contract. But because bills of lading are intended to be transferable, because they are intended to facilitate international, uh, international trade, they have to be able to change hands. And therefore, there has to be some way for somebody who wasn't originally a party to the bill to acquire rights under it. And that's achieved by means of statute. 
um, th this concept of um, only the parties to the contract being bound by it is sometimes referred to as privity of contract. So it's sometimes thought of as the privity of contract problem that arises under bills of lading. And it's solved by currently the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1992. Um, but throughout the centuries, as long as there's been international trade, there has been some sort of solution to this problem in statute. Um, next slide, please. So who might have title to sue under a bill of lading? Well, there are four possibilities, and we'll look at these all in more detail in a moment. And the four possibilities are the shipper, who is the initial party, who is, a, who is an initial original party to the bill of lading contract. It could be a named consignee shown on the bill. It could be the final endorsee of the bill, or it could be the person who has possession of the bill. And which one it is depends on which type of bill we're dealing with. Is it a straight bill or a negotiable bill? a two-order bill, either a bearer bill where nobody's indicated as the consignee, or a negotiable bill with an, a two-order consignee and a series of endorsements. The important thing is that only one party can have title to sue under COGSA 92. So to that extent, the concept of privity of contract is maintained, but that person changes during the course of the transactions involving the bill. And you might be thinking, well, someone's missing here, aren't they? Somebody, that somebody is the person who actually owns the goods. Um, and it's important to remember that title to sue under the bill is different from title to the goods. Even though the bill of lading is at times evidence of title to the goods, title to sue under the bill is a separate question. And the person who has title to sue under the bill under COGSA 92 might not be the person who suffered the loss. And we'll have a, another look at that in a moment. Um, so here are the key provisions of COGSA 92. Um, I haven't written them out in full because they're not exactly uh, an entertaining read, but um, this is just a list of where to look for the main provisions. So section one defines a bill of lading and a seaway bill. And section two is the operative section. This is the one that actually sets out that rights are transferred under this type of contract, this bill of lading contract. And they are transferred to this person known as the lawful holder. And we'll look at what that means in a moment. Uh, section two, two deals with timing. Now, obviously there has to be some limit to transfer of rights under a bill. And at the point where the bill becomes spent, no further transfer of rights is possible. And by spent, we mean that the carrier has fulfilled its obligations under the contract of carriage. The goods have been delivered to a consignee, to a, to a receiver, and the bill no longer has any effect as a contract of carriage. Um, there are exceptions to that, which we will also look at. Um, the lawful holder under section 2.4 can claim on behalf of the person who has suffered the loss where that is a different person, but they're not obliged to do so. So another solution may be needed at times. And section 2.5 sets out that the rights of the original party to the bill or subsequent endorsees are extinguished when the bill is transferred to a new lawful holder. And then section 5.2 is an important section which defines who the holder of the bill of lading actually is. So the next slide, please. Um, who has title to sue under COGSA 92? Well, it's the lawful holder under section 2.1. In the first instance, that's the shipper, who is the initial party to the contract. The shipper gives up the right to sue when he transfers his rights under the bill to the next lawful holder. But the shipper does retain some responsibility in certain circumstances as an original party to the contract, for example, where dangerous cargo has been loaded. Next slide, please. And this is what Section 5.2 actually says about the lawful holder. 
So it's a, either, it's one of three possibilities under section 5.2. And I know we've just said that there are four possibilities, but the fourth possibility is the shipper who is an original contract, original party to the contract, and therefore doesn't need the help of a statute to take rights under it. The section 5.2a says that the first possibility is a person with possession of the bill who, by virtue of being the person identified in the bill, is the consignee of the goods to which the bill relates. So that means that if there is one named consignee on the bill shown in the consignee box, that person has rights under the bill. And then section 5.2b gives another alternative, which is a person with possession of the bill as a result of completion by delivery of the bill, of any endorsement of the bill, or in the case of a bearer bill, of any other transfer of the bill. That trans translates to the person who actually has the, the bill as a result of taking the bill from a previous holder with a stamp on the back, an endorsement saying that that person has given up their rights. Or if the bear, if it is a bearer bill, which we'll discuss again in a moment, if they simply hold the bill itself. And finally, we have this rather convoluted provision. Um, it can be a person with possession of the bill as a result of any transaction by virtue of which he would have become a holder failing, falling within paragraph A or B above, had not the transaction been affected at a time when possession of the bill no longer gave a right as against the carrier to possession of the goods to which the bill relates. And if we put that into more normal English, it simply means that you can be a lawful holder of the bill of lading at a time when the bill has already become spent, the goods have been delivered to somebody by the carrier, provided that the transaction, which gives rise to your right to the bill, was effected, I concluded, before that point where the bill became spent. So next slide, please. So who is the lawful holder depends on the different types of bills of lading. So if it's a straight bill, there is a named consignee. It's not to order. It's usually fairly straightforward in that the person who is the lawful holder is the named consignee. But if you have an order to order bill, then there has to be a bit more of a, an investigation into who is the lawful holder. It's either the consignee who is named to order, or if there is no consignee named, it's to order only, then it will depend on how the bill has been passed on from one holder to the next. An order bill depends on the either the series of endorsements or who actually holds the bill at the end of the process. So if it's a bearer bill, nobody is shown named on the bill. It's just the physical possession of the bill which gives rights. Um, seaway bills, which are dealt with under section 1.3, importantly are given the same status as a straight bill. So COGSA 92 does apply to seaway bills. There are, however, significant differences between straight bills and seaway bills, which relate to how the hague hague Bisbee rules apply to them, um, in that the rules don't apply compulsorily to seaway bills. They do apply compulsorily to straight bills of lading. And also the requirements for delivery are different. Under a seaway bill, the person with the right to collect the goods from the, to take delivery of the goods from the carrier has only to, to prove to the carrier who he is. It doesn't, he doesn't need possession of the actual bill. Uh, next slide, please. So who is the lawful holder? As I said, depends on the type of bill and on if it's an order bill on the order of endorsements. But it is also important to note that all the three possibilities under Section 5 of COGSA require the bill to be in the physical possession of that person. So we'll look, I'm going to look in more detail at what happens at the beginning of the, of the chain of transactions, what happens with the shipper um, slightly later on. But basically, if the bill remains with the shipper, then title to sue remains with the shipper. It doesn't get passed on. 
but as soon as it's passed on, Title II follows the bill. So the next um, next slide, please. So who can be the lawful holder? Well, as we said, four possibilities: the shipper, the named consignee on a straight bill, the final endorsee of a two-order bill, or the physical holder of a bearer bill. Each one of them, however, does have to have possession of the bill. Next slide, please. And this is just a summary that um, if there is no transfer of the bill, then rights don't get transferred. So exam for example, if the shipper stamps the bill to the order of a named consignee and then sticks it in a drawer and doesn't pass it on to anybody else, that is almost certainly not enough to pass title to sue to the next person. Um, because under COGSA 92, Section 52, the holder of the bill must be both identified as a consignee and have physical possession of the bill. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings us to the question of what is an endorsement? Um, Henry and Tom dealt with this in some detail in the first seminar and showed you some examples of endorsements. But it's basically a stamp or a signature by which one party indicates that it is giving up rights under the bill and passing those rights to somebody else, the endorser to the endorsee. And the endorsement can be either to a named endorsee or it can be to the order of a named endorsee or it can be simply in blank. It can just be an acknowledgement that the current holder is giving up rights under it. It must be accompanied by a physical transfer of possession to be effective. But where the bill is a bearer bill, so where it starts off with no named in consignee, just to order in the consignee box, there isn't actually a requirement for any further endorsement once the bill starts its journey down the chain of, um, of holders. It just the possession of the bill itself suffices to give rights to that person. But again, we will look at that slightly more in more detail in a moment. Um, next slide, please. So examples of endorsements, it's either the stamp of the shipper to the first endorsee or the stamp of that endorsee to the next or to the final endorsee. And it can be or it can just be a, a stamp in blank passing on the rights. Next um, slide, please. And the effect on title to sue depends on the different type of endorsement. So if a bill is endorsed to the order of a named endorsee, that endorsee acquires title to sue under the bill. If it's to order an endorsed in blank, it's a bearer bill, so the lawful holder is the person with possession of it. And that should always ring a few bells of alarm in at the minds of anyone dealing with a cargo claim, because the, if the bill is endorsed in blank or it starts off as a, as a bearer bill, it becomes either becomes or starts off as a bearer bill then it's not going to have any evidence on its face of who actually has title to sue. And it will probably be necessary to investigate the series of sale contracts to make sure that we know who the final holder of that bill is, because that person is the only person who has the right to bring the claim against the carrier. And this can throw quite a large spanner in the works um, when it comes to actually starting proceedings or even asking for a time extension. This has to be checked right from the beginning. Um, so the next, next slide, please. The timing of endorsements is also very important because under section 2.2, as we, we looked at this earlier, the lawful holder still has a title to sue under the Bill of Lading. If he actually becomes the holder of the bill at a time after the goods have been delivered, so long as the sale contract under which he takes ownership, delivery of the goods, uh, was entered into before the bill became set spent, before the goods were delivered by the, by the carrier. So the effect of that, again, is that there can be an evidential problem with bringing a claim for any damage to the cargo. It's usually necessary to disclose the relevant sale contract 
to prove that it was entered into before the goods were delivered, before the bill became spent. Next slide, please. Some endorsements don't have any effect at all. And COGSA 92 does deal with these. The most obvious one is where there was no intention by the previous holder to pass rights. For example, where the bill has been acquired fraudulently by the new holder. Um, Section 52C of COGSA 92 makes, uh, makes it clear that in order to become a lawful holder, you have to hold the bill in good faith. So that prevents any rights being passed on where there has been fraud. Another example of an endorsement having no effect is where the final endorsee or the final the person who has taken delivery of the cargo has simply stamped the bank, the back of the bill to acknowledge that the goods have been delivered and that the bill is now spent. And that's sometimes referred to as a stamp of accomplishment. Sometimes that can be confusing because it can look like an endorsement. It can look like an endorsement in blank, but it is therefore sometimes necessary to bring further evidence that that is a stamp of accomplishment and not a further endorsement. Um, where the endorsement is made pursuant to an arrangement entered into, the, entered into after the goods have been delivered and the bill spent, that endorsement as well will have no effect on title to sue. Next slide, please. So let's have a closer look at what happens at the beginning of the series of transactions. When the bill is in the hands of the shipper, the shipper, as I said, is the initial party, the original party to the bill of lading contract, and therefore has rights under it as an original party in the same way that any other contracting party under English law has a right has rights under the contract. Um, but the question is, does that does the shipper have to do anything in order to pass those rights to the first, the next holder, the first holder in the chain? And COGSA 52A makes it very clear that transfer of the, posi of the possession of the bill must must be affected in order for the next person to become a holder. So where it's a named consignee and the, that named consignee has possession of the bill, it's probably not necessary for the shipper to do anything other than pass the bill to the named consignee. But it's more complicated if the bill is issued to order and there is no named consignee. If it's a, a bearer bill, the, if the consignee box simply contains the words to order. Um, next slide, please. Where the consignee isn't named, then probably the correct way to, to look at this is that the bill is consigned to the order of the shipper. So in a way, you could say that those words to order in the consignee box should, if they were read in full, say to the order of the party identified in the shipper box. So that means that there has to be some kind of acknowledgement by the shipper of the rights being passed to the next end or C. This point isn't entirely clear under English law. Surprisingly, this hasn't actually been examined in detail in any published decisions, but the logical conclusion must be that because physical possession of the, of the bill is necessary and some acknowledgement of passing on the rights is also required under section five, the initial endorsement by the shipper is probably needed to start the bill on its way down the chain as a bearer bill. And if the endorsement is in blank, then after that, rights are simply passed on by delivering the bill to the next holder without any further endorsement. But that initial endorsement is probably required. And this is, again, something which, particularly from a carrier's point of view, you may want to investigate from an early stage, because if there is any question mark over the initial passing of rights from the shipper, that could have a very large effect on the claim and on, on title to sue further down the chain. Uh, next slide, please. 
there's also the questions if, if the shipper has failed to endorse the bill a, a two order bill are subsequent endorsements then valid is there some way in which the the next holder endorsing it can rectify that well probably not because in order for the rights to pass into the first holder in the first instance the shipper's endorsement was required and if that's correct then the ship the subsequent holder had no right to transfer to the next holder so it's this is a, a situation it doesn't happen very often but if you again it's another alarm bell to ring if you have a a bearer bill, a two order bill with no named consignee, this is something to look into at an early stage. Um, the next slide, please. So what happens if the wrong party, if you like, ends up with title to sue, a party who hasn't suffered any loss and has no further interest in the goods? Well, all might not be lost. Um, there is, as I say, the possibility under COGS 92 for the party with title to sue to sue on behalf of the party who suffered the loss. But that party might not be willing to do that, um, might not be willing to potentially incur liabilities for costs. So one possibility might be an assignment of the rights and the party with title to sue under COGSA 92 is entitled to take an assignment of rights from the person who has got title to sue. And the normal principles apply to the validity of the assignment. It's um, governed by the Law of Property Act 1925 under English law. And the assignment must be in writing. It must be absolute, so not conditional on anything. Notice must be given before proceedings started. Um, very important point. And the assigner must have title to sue at the time of the assignment. And again, this can also raise problems. If the, this is the position under English law, so one possible solution, if some of those can, if some of those requirements can't be met, is to make an assignment subject to a different law, because the English courts will recognise an assignment under another law if it is made correctly under that law. Um, next slide, please. The effect of assignment is that the assignee is able to sue in his own name without needing to name the assignor as well. And this is different from subrogation, where the person taking the rights has to sue in the name of the original party. And this all uh, occurs mainly in the context of an insurer bringing claims. Um, there is, under some laws, uh, I think our, our our French attendees will probably recognise that um, under French law, there is an automatic assignment of the rights to an insurer on settlement of the policy. So the key question, if an insurer is, is becomes assigned to the rights of the assured, is does the assigner, the assured, have title to sue at the time of the assignment? So this is, an, again, a question that has to be considered from the very beginning. Under English law, a, an insurer becomes subrogated to the rights of the assured, so the claim has to be brought in the name of the original assured. Um, next slide, please. So just to summarise all of that, these are the key points when it comes to considering who has title to sue under a bill of lading. Uh, firstly, it's really important to look at this question right from the beginning because from the very moment at least when the first time extension is sought it, it's essential that that is given to the correct party so all of these questions have to be sorted out right from the beginning when the uh, claim first arises and also security if you're going to ask for security it's got to be provided to the correct party and also who, if the wrong person has title to sue, what needs to be done in order to al allow the person who has suffered the loss to recover the loss? Do you need an assignment? In which case, you do need to start looking at how, how that assignment is to be affected and the right of the assignor under the bill. Um, straight bills generally are straightforward, but you still do need to check that the shipper has transferred the bill 
to the consignee that the right to sue hasn't actually remained with the shipper. To order and especially bearer bills can be very complex and often they will require an investigation into the underlying sale contracts. So again, it's important to, if you are going to have to bring further evidence of title to sue, to know that from the beginning and to start making your investigations into that right from the beginning so that the claim can be properly evidenced. So that's um, those are the key points on the person who has title to sue under a bill of lading. And um, Alex is now going to look at the other side of the question, which is who can be sued under the bill? Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Lisa. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so as you um, as you know from um, Lisa's part of the talk, a bill of lading evidence is a contract. Um, the parties to most general English law commercial contracts will know who the, the contractual counterparty is and, will, uh, and that will often be set out expressly and prominently in the recitals of a written contract, particularly if it has been drafted by lawyers. Um, however, this is not necessarily the case for a bill of lading contract in the sense that when a shipper um, puts the goods, uh, which is probably just sold on board a ship, um, often having made the, the shipping arrangements for an agent, such as a freight forwarder, um, it may not be at all obvious to him who it is that he's actually contracted to carry the goods, um, that is, who is the contractual carrier. And the, the contractual carrier could be the owner of the vessel aboard which the, the cargo has been shipped, um, or it could be one of potentially several charterers and sub-charterers of the vessel. So, why does it actually matter um, who the contractual carrier is? Well, there may be a number of reasons why cargo interests or indeed the vessel owners might need to know this. But, but for the purposes of the current series of talks, a, a cargo claimant needs to be able to identify the contractual carrier so that he can make sure he brings his claim and protects the limitation period against the right person. And secondly, so that he can ascertain whether it will be possible um, to obtain security for his claim and, if necessary, to do so by threatening to arrest the ship. Um, so whilst this talk is primarily concerned with bill of lading contracts, in order to identify the carrier, we need to briefly consider the different types of charter party. And in this instance, it's important distinct to distinguish between bare boat charters or demise charters on the one hand and time and voice charters on the others. So bare boat charters are simply contracts for the hire of the hull and machinery of the vessel itself without a crew or master. And under a bare boat um, charter, the, 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 the charter normally provides the master and crew uh, um, and therefore conducts the actual carriage operation. So when the master to, of a ship that is subject to a bare boat charter signs a bill of lading, he will be doing so on behalf of his employers, um, the bare boat charterers, rather than the actual owners of the ship. Therefore, saving exceptional circumstances where a ship is subject to a bare boat charter and the bill of lading is signed by or on behalf of the master, the actual owners of the vessel will not be party to any bill of lading or contract of carriage. So when um, a, a cargo claimant, or, or um, if you're the claims handler, you are looking to protect time under a bill of lading signed by the vessel owner, um, it is always important to consider, uh, sorry, signed by the master, it's always important to consider whether the vessel might be subject to a bare boat charter, in which case the carrier and the person to protect time against is likely to be the bare boat charterer meaning that if you have obtained a time extension from the actual ship owner, um, you, you would unfortunately be time barred. Um, and, and if the carrier is the bare boat charterer, then unless the, the, the same corporate entity actually owns some other vessels, um, it might be difficult to obtain security um, for, for their claim. Um, so if we're acting for, for cargo claimants, we'll normally check an opponent vessel on, on SeaWeb or Sea Searcher. 
um, as these databases will sometimes say if a vessel is subject to a bare boat charter. Um, however, the only really reliable way to check if there is a bare boat charter in place is to search the relevant registry, um, which may involve um, instructing a, um, a, an inquiry agency or a foreign lawyer. Um, but for instance, in the, the, the UK registry, um, bare boat charter is recorded on part four of the registry. So if it's a British flag ship, um, it should be quite easy to find out whether there's a bare boat charter in place. Um, so, so usually when, when one um, negotiates security um, from a, a vessel's P&I club, either the club will confirm in, um, in, in the letter of undertaking that the vessel is not subject to a bare boat charter, or if the club is unwilling to confirm this themselves, they'll arrange for the member to, uh, to provide a demise side letter um, to the same effect. However, if you do actually have to arrest a vessel, it's very important to make sure that there is no bare boat charter in place, um, as if you arrest a vessel when your actual cause of action is not against the, the, the owners of the vessel, but against the bare boat charterer. Um, this could amount to wrongful arrest, um, which may may prove to be a very expensive mistake. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So, um, um, could I have the next slide, please? After that. Okay, so, um, when I um, when I refer to uh, to charters bills in this context. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, bills of lading under which the, the time charterer or voyage charterer is the carrier. Um, and there are, there are two general principles to remember. So firstly, the, the question of whether a bill of lading is an owner's bill or a charterer's bill is one of construction of the bill of lading, not of the, um, not of the charter party. And um, the signature um, of the bill of lading by or on behalf of the master is prima facie evidence that the contract evidenced by the bill of lading is with the owner um, unless there is a bare boat charter in place. So it, it, it would be for the owners to rebut that presumption. And um, if the bill of lading is actually signed by the master himself, then it is very likely to be an owner's bill unless it can be evidenced that the, ship, that the shipper actually knew that the, the master did not have authority to bind the owner. Um, and bills of lading are, but bills of lading are often, if, if not normally, signed by an agent uh, appointed by the, the charterer. Um, but, but as I've said, if, if they are purported to sign on behalf of the master rather than the charterers, then there will still be a rebuttable presumption that it will be an owner's bill. However, there have been a number of reported cases where notwithstanding that the bill of lading has been signed for and on behalf of the master, it has been held that the, the bill of lading was a charterer's bill in circumstances um, where there has been a specific indication that the, the charterers um, of the vessel, uh, the, the charter of the vessel was the carrier. So the, the most important of these decisions is the House of Lords decision in the Starsin, which is a 2004 case. And it was held that when identifying the carrier, um, greater weight should be given to the, the provisions on the front of the bill, and in particular to the, the contents of the signature box. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, however, it should be noted that um, in that case, the, the signature box contained the bespoke types as opposed to printed words as agents for the charterer and in brackets, the carrier. And, and below this was a rubber stamp giving the names of the charterer's agents and two manuscript signatures. Now, the reason why this is significant is that it, it was and is generally accepted um, principle of construction, that greater weight should be given to words and clauses that have been specifically chosen by the parties over those which are standard, standard printed wording. And um, in the star scene that there was also a printed demise or identity of carrier clause on the reverse of the bill stating that the carrier was the ship owner and, um, and pursuant to that the court of appeal had ruled that the bill of lading was an owner's uh, bill um, but that decision was overturned by the house of lords 
So, so it's important to bear in mind that the star scene was decided on a particular set of facts and where there are conflicting clauses on the front and back of the bill of lading, the position will not necessarily be as clear cut as in the star scene, and one needs to construe the bill of lading as a whole, including the terms on the reverse. Um, it's also important to note that the, the mere fact that a bit of lading is printed on a charterer's form, has their logo on it, which you often see, will not be enough to make it a charterer's bill. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So lastly, what happens if um, the, the parties to, to a charter party, normally a voice charter, and, and the bit of lading are the same? Well, one often comes across this situation. Um, and um, in circumstances where the bill is issued to a charterer, then it is, is a receipt for the goods and a document for type, document of title only. Um, and it does not evidence the contract of carriage. Um, rather, the contract of carriage is contained and evidenced by the charter party, which takes precedence. So a, 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 a charterer who is also the lawful holder of the bill of lading would have to sue under the charter party if the carrier is the carrier under the bill is also the the disponent owner under the charter party. Um, but what is a sort of peculiarity of English law is that if the bill of lading is then endorsed by the the charter to a third party, then a new contract springs up between the carrier and the endorsee that is evidenced by the bill of lading, notwithstanding that the original contract with the 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 the, 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 the original consignee um, wasn't. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. So in summary, um, we've looked at the importance of establishing who the parties to a bill of lading contract are. It's very important that a cargo claim is, is brought by the correct party with title to sue or, or their assignee. Um, however, it's equally important to, to make sure that the, the contractual claim is pursued against the correct party, i.e. the contractual carrier. Um, correctly identifying both parties is absolutely crucial um, when seeking time extensions or protecting limitation periods. And the, the identity of the contractual, cargo, uh, contractual carrier um, is also very important for the purposes of attaining security. So remember to check for bareboat charters. Um, and then, so I said, I said this, this, um, this talk was the first of two halves. On, on the 18th of April, we'll be considering what the terms of the Bill of Lading contracts are um, and, and, and specifically considering clauses paramount and the incorporation of, of charter party terms into Bill of Lading contracts. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so so that's, the, um, that's the talk. Um, and um, I'm just um, seeing if there's some, some questions come in. Um, so we've got, got one question come in, which is, could the claimant claim against the actual carrier and the, the contractual carrier at the, same, at the same time? Will both parties be, be liable for, for the same claims? And under English law, um, a, a claimant can only recover damages for a given loss once. So if a contractual carrier has, has paid the claim in full, the claimant cannot subsequently claim the same loss again from the, the actual carrier and, and, and make a double recovery. However, the, um, the cargo claimant might have a cause of action against more than one party and may want to protect both time bars and then decide which party to pursue, depending on security that is available. So, so um, if, for instance, um, if you have a time charterer's bill, so the contractual carrier is the time charter of, of the vessel, the cargo claimant may still be able to pursue the actual carrier in uh, of the uh, the actual owner, sorry, of the vessel in tort. And the, the the problem with tort claims is that the claimant won't be able to rely on the law and jurisdiction provisions in the charter party because their claim in tort exists out with the, 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 the contract. So they may, may not get English law and jurisdiction. And the, the jurisdiction 
of tort claim will depend on on finding a, a, a country which is willing to accept jurisdiction. And, and one way of doing that would be to arrest the vessel, um, which will again depend on the, the law, the ability to do so will depend on the laws of the country where you're, you're trying to affect the arrest. Um, and um, the, the, the port, the country of the port of arrest might be willing to accept jurisdiction, um, or if, if neither of the, the parties, if having arrested the vessel, neither of the parties um, want the claim to proceed in that jurisdiction, um, they might be able to come to an ad hoc jurisdiction agreement and, for instance, agree English law and jurisdiction. Um, it's also worth noting that a cargo claim, a cargo claim could have a, a third cause of action under a voice charter, uh, where the actual owner of the vessel, the bill of lading carrier, and the disponent owner under the voyage charter are all different people. Um, however, again, with disponent owners, it's, it's, it's often difficult to obtain security. Um, so you, you, know, you would probably um, probably look to, 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 to bring the claim, to pursue the cause of action for which you, you're able to obtain security. Um, okay. I don't know, if, Lisa, if you want to come in on one of the other questions. Um, yes, we, we we did have one other question raised about, um, well, electronic bills of lading, which um, I think for as long as I've been talking about bills of lading, um, from time to time, the question of electronic bills has has arisen. Um, we did actually just sort of ask around our colleagues whether anyone had ever really dealt with a, a claim which depended, um, which concerned a, a purely electronic bill of lading, and it still seems to be quite rare for people to come across these. Um, it still seems that um, it, it's probably that probably will change. I mean, the specific question that was raised was where it leaves P and I cover uh, where an electronic bill is issued, and. Um, the answer seems to be that the international group um, last year agreed to recognise three different three three systems under which electronic bills can be issued as being um, approved systems, and they are the three big ones um, that any of you who deal with electronic bills will be familiar with. And um, the international group has now confirmed that cover PNI cover is available for claims under those bills, provided that the claim would have arisen under a paper bill. Um, so that seems to be the position in terms of um, PNI cover now. Um, the other thing about electronic bills is if it ever did get to the point where there were specific issues arising in claims under electronic bills, COGSA 92 actually has a provision, um, section 15, that allows the Secretary of State for, well, for Transport to issue uh, a statutory instrument dealing with them. So it could be possible that at some point, if this becomes an issue, COGSA 92 might sprout an appendix to deal with how electronic bills should be interpreted under the, the statute. And it's quite likely that um, that provision would say that where the bill talks about possession, which obviously you can't have possession of an electronic bill, uh, but you can have control of an electronic bill. And with modern blockchain technology, control of an electronic document can be very reliable. So um, probably the answer would be in due course that um, whoever controls the electronic bill will be read to be the person in possession of the bill of lading. Um, I say that's a bit of a guess because we don't know yet because so far um, Parliament hasn't made any moves to um, amend COGSA 92 or to deal specifically with electronic bills of lading but um, clearly it is something that's going to develop um, over the next decade or so so we have to wait and see. Um, I don't think we've had any other questions come in um, during the course, uh, during the course of the talk. So um, if that, that seems to be um, the end of the question. So, but of course, if anybody does think of anything that they'd like to ask us about, you have our, our contact details and all our colleagues' contact details. So you know, please feel free to um, contact us if you, if you want to. Um, otherwise, well, that's, um, 
that's probably it for today and um, we look forward to seeing some of you at the next at the next webinar and that's on the um, the 18th of april and um as it as it says on the slide we're going to consider you know, what the terms of the the, the, the bill of lading contract are and um in particular the incorporation of um, charter party terms and and um, clauses paramount um, so thank you very much thank you everybody